Like your sense of humor, like <laughs> even, if, even if like it was just a sense of humor, like I found that so entertaining. Yeah, but no, just you know, like your concepts and how you, all your analogies, like that was very profound. Yeah. Like I felt like you explaining, even though we did like variations of like a move, right. however many ways, like just from you, um, just like okay, we do the move, and then you start elaborating more, and you right. like I see like yes. your yeah. teaching or explanation process, right. like yeah, it solidified the information way more than just, and there's no criticism to like right. other um, artists where they just like hey, this is like a crazy turn pattern, right. it's super difficult, and if you get it, you get it. If not, right. then go practice yes. it, and it's yeah. like yeah, that it, it builds more of a mental and uh, like I guess emotional connection to yeah, like to sure. the movement, like why you do things and how we do it and the reason behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, so, no, we really appreciate that. I'm cause. so glad, you know, what happens is that the format, this format, it's not conducive to that. Like, you, right. you have like 55 minutes to make a point, and for the most part, what ends up happening is you're just spending an hour being entertained by the, the, the teacher. Like, it's, it's an entertainment moment, you know? It's not really education focused. Because again, the, the 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 structure of the system doesn't allow for it, right? That it's really hard in 60 minutes to to make a point. And again, what happens is you develop expectations in the participants that they need to move around 100 miles an hour, absorbing a thousand moves from one hour to the next, with different people contradicting the last person. You know what I'm saying? Like th th there's no cohesiveness in the in the information. And it's this like c collector mentality of like just collecting a bunch of experiences because that stuff is not affecting you as a dancer. It's just giving you more stuff to do at the level that you're already at, you know? And I, I felt at a certain point that it was, I was, it bothered me. I felt like I was cheating people, you know? And I was cheating myself. Like the interaction wasn't benefiting anyone. It was just, you know, it's just entertainment for the sake of entertainment and I get paid and I leave and you are no better off for having, you know. So, yeah, and because everything is kind of like a popularity contest now and it's all like you're just trying to set up circumstances that you can then put on social media to, to keep your name rolling. It's like there is no real bankable logic uh, commercially to really giving people something of substance you know it doesn't really benefit you financially or otherwise in terms of like the machine you know and so the only thing that keeps me sane is is conceiving of myself as the alternative voice and i'm there to be the alternative voice you know and because and i do this on stage too because there is such a homogenous paradigm it's okay for me to go in and shake things up a little bit because there's enough of the other stuff i don't have to contribute to that because they ha they've got it they're they're set in that area so i could come in and, and point to things of substance and and plant seeds and hopefully get them to look at things differently um and so i don't have to fit in i i just need to be true to what i'm trying to do and what my impact is going to be you know and it personalizes that and it keeps me from wanting to jump through a, a you know, pane glass window because it's like you, you, you start to go nuts. So you feel like you're screaming into the wind, you know? It's like, um, at the end of the day, nothing is that straightforward, you know? Life is counterintuitive most of the time, you know? And so the reality of things is usually much more complex than you can come up with on your own. And you need somebody to kind of direct the way you consider things so that you can see more of the breadth of reality involved in the thing. And that takes time and it takes commitment, it takes patience, and it's all things that like don't make money, right? Like McDonald's is not built on patience. It's like everything has to be fast. Everything's got to be easy. You know, can't really be nutritious. Otherwise that costs time, right? It's like... McDonald's makes way more money than any five-star yep. chef Michelin restaurant. You know, it doesn't matter how famous they are. Overall, commercially, McDonald's is more successful. So there used to be, I felt like, there used to be a, a, 
a, an underground subculture counterculture that you know you could speak to and exist within and talk about the big machine from another place and it feels like even that like everything's been kind of social media kind of like stamped out underground culture like because nothing is underground anymore everything is exposed to everyone and there's a fundamental issue with popularizing things in that there's no way to do it without without diluting it right the, 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 there's no way to get it into that many heads without it completely turning into some strange you know translucent image of what the real thing is you know and the reason why underground stuff it was so attractive to those people and why it was so potent was because you were able to keep it protected you know and you were able to engage in it in a visceral and a deep way and during those times everybody's thing was like as long as we're popularizing salsa and we're popularizing salsa and we're popularizing salsa and that's what you know that's good it's good if we're popularizing there's more people dancing and that's good that's good that's good and I kept thinking, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I don't know that we're doing the right thing in making it so accessible to everyone because they respect it less, they care for it less. You know, it's like dropping the price on something, you know, because, because you're afraid people won't pay. And then having that mentality that if it's worth it, you need to let people know it's worth it because they'll take care of it differently if they pay for it. You know, they... They had to give a chunk of skin for it they're gonna you know they're going to care for it differently you know than if they paid two bucks for it or it didn't cost them anything and that's what's happening is you're getting fast food so who cares if i'm worried about the culture if i'm worried about you know philosophical concepts within the dances I, you know i didn't it didn't cost me anything it's just stuff you know and and that changes how people perceive uh of stuff, you know, it it it, uh, it makes it really hard to maintain depth in any capacity. You know, you're you're constantly dealing with uh, things being watered down so that they can be palatable to the masses, mass appeal, right? Gangstar, somebody I used to listen to this group called Gangstar. Um, it's a, a rap group, uh, uh, DJ Premier and uh, Guru MC Guru, right? And he's got a song called Mass Appeal, you know, and th there was this thing in hip hop in the 80s and 90s of like not going pop, right? Like they constantly spoke about that in the lyrics. I'm not going to sell out. I'm not going pop. Like hip hop was hip hop and we did it and we didn't care that it was it was OK for family listening because, you know, we were going to stay true to what it was until they didn't. Right. Until they figured out they could make a lot of money and. If they made it more commercially viable, if more people could listen to it, you're gonna make more money. And now you have moguls that sold out and now the thing is completely destroyed and there's no semblance of what it once was uh, available anymore. And it's so sad, but it's one of those things, you know? It's like, I, I, I look at the parallels in that a lot. You know, I, I saw it in martial arts too, like traditional martial arts turning into sport martial arts, eventually turning into like MMA and watching that evolution happen and like lamenting the the death of the karate kid generation you know like the old wise person putting the young person through paces not so that they could be better fighters but so that they could be better people you know what i mean and you now now culture is it doesn't work it doesn't work it's got to work you got to be able to kill somebody in 2 seconds or knock somebody out in 2 seconds and it's like i had a student older older man uh, his granddaughter was getting into fights at school, and so the, the thought occurs to his son, the father of the girl, to put the girl into martial arts so that she would get some discipline. They put her into mixed martial arts. The only thing that happens is she gets better at beating people up, mm -hmm. and like yeah. all of a sudden, it's like, and I tried to explain to him, it doesn't work like that anymore. It once w did, where the experience of learning martial art 
transformed you, especially in those formative years where your brain's developing and you have that rigid discipline. And I'm not talking about the type of discipline that a kid that grows up in boxing has, right? Because you listen to somebody like Ryan Garcia, this famous young boxer, super famous YouTube, you know, social media kid. You listen to him talk and the kid has zero discipline, right? He's been boxing since he's a kid. He's been involved in, a, in athletics. He got good at it. Zero like development of self involved in that, you know? The kid can't be trained. The trainer's saying, you know, I can't train him. You don't really train him. You just kind of advise because he trains himself. And it's like, what are you talking about? My karate instructor would have a field day with, with, that, with a kid like that, you know? The more talented you are, the more, the higher the stakes, right? It's like Star Wars, you know? You get a talented student and it's like, the, the, the chances of them going to the dark side are way greater and you have to be, you know, settled enough as a teacher to be able to keep that in check, that ego in check, you know? Because what happens is, and I, you see it all the time in dance where you get this young kid that can do stuff, people go crazy over these kids. And they bring them on stage and they say, how fantastic is this kid? And the MC is like, you know, you're, you're special. And they keep filling this kid's head with stuff, you know, and now all of a sudden the kid's entitled and the kid expects and the kid thinks and that you're not making them work for anything and you're not, you know, forcing them to earn stuff. And you end up with a monster on your hands, you know, that, that is like, you know, not really a better person. So... You know, it's a, it's precarious. Like having kids is precarious. Like being a teacher is precarious. It's a huge responsibility because that person's development, you know, is at stake. Like they're putting that in your hands. And I don't take any of that stuff lightly, you know, like I don't think anybody should, but again, the machine and the commercialness and the, you know, we're just in a time now where it is not sexy. The things that were sexy to me, like the, the, old stories about samurais, like the old stories about in the Zen temples or in the Buddhist temples in China where they, 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 the monks leave you outside the temple asking to get in for three days before they let you in, right? Like you need to know you really want to study here and we're going to, you know, you have to show that, you have to go through that. Monks now, today, 2023, they prepare young monks for that trial. They know that they're gonna to have to sit in the, they go into the lobby, an attendant comes out and tells them, there's no room here, we can't accept you at this temple, please leave. And for three days, they bring you rice, I'm sorry, you have to leave, we have no room for you, the teacher won't accept you. And on the third day, they tell you, come on in, right? Like you, you imagine you doing that with somebody today in salsa, forget it, you know? You don't even know what you're asking for. Do you really wanna do this? Do you really wanna learn? Because I'm not here to serve you, you're coming to the master to, to, to learn something. And people say, um, you know, I want to study with you so bad. When are you coming to Israel? Or when are you coming? In my day, it wasn't like that. You went, if you wanted to learn something from the person, you went to the mountain to find them, right? All the movies I watched, that's what happened, you know? They go up to Shaolin and they say, I, I, you please, I want to learn from so-and-so or, you know, I, I need to learn this you know, you went and found it. Now everything is like, when are they bringing you over here so you can teach me? And then you teach me the way I want you to teach me. And hey, can you, can you slow down? Or can you, can you do that again? Or can you, karate, that doesn't happen. The thing is that I, that I come from a different world, you know, a different era. I, I, I studied martial arts as a kid. My karate instructor, when I was 16, I started at nine. When I was 16, he introduced me to, to, um, Zen meditation and Zen philosophy. I got hooked into Zen heavy in college and since like voraciously absorbing the material on that stuff, trying to understand it. My teacher said, that's the next level for you. You know, like, so my reference when I came to dance in a formal capacity, the teacher student relationship in my brain was established. Like how I viewed that was established. You know, it, it, it was, uh, I was emulating the stories I had heard, the legends, the stuff I read, the movies I watched, the whole Saturday morning Kung Fu theater, like 
uh, all that stuff was what I grew up on, you know, and it, Yoda, you know, Mr. Miyagi, like, I wanted to be them. I didn't want to be Luke and, or Daniel. I wanted to be Yoda or Mr. Miyagi, you know, it was like, Mr. Miyagi told Daniel, no questions. I say you do no questions. Yeah, but at that, 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 no questions, right? Like, you don't tell, the teacher tells you something and you, it hits you two years later. Oh shit, this is what he was talking about, you know? Because they make you run into a wall. They force you to run into the wall. Like you, you instead of giving it to you, they kind of set you up. They, they, it's just like, a, you know, doing the piñata. They set you up in the right direction so that you bump into it. And when you bump into it, it's yours. Like you own it because you, you came to a realization about it. Somebody didn't try to feed it to you, you know? It, it hits you in a more impactful way that can be used more universally, applied more universally than here, just do this this way, right? And so in Zen, it's like that. It's very cryptic. Like they're setting you up to realize on your own because that's how learning happens, right? Understanding happens through you, not through the other person. The other person's trying to kind of slap you in the right directions like a pinball so that you end up boom running into the thing that you're supposed to understand and again that we have metaphors like that in the dance you know i do that with movement i don't we don't try to directly do the step we set up the parameters that would allow the step to exist and now you have to learn how to allow it to happen to you once everything is set up you know and it manifests differently. You understand it differently. You apply it differently. It, it resonates in your life, not just when you put your dance shoes on and you're on the wood, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me in this environment. It was hard for me in the early 2000s. It's completely like uh, an anomaly to me now because it's been completely blanketed by this status quo the homogenization everybody thinks they're being unique and by by asserting their quest to be unique they're all falling into line in the same concepts and they're not exactly they're not because that's not how you find yourself you know you, 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 you're, you're working within a paradigm that is going to funnel you because you, you're trying to be accepted at the end of the day. And expressing yourself can't be bound by acceptance or else you'll, you'll never find yourself. You spend your time trying to appease what the group is telling you they'll accept. And so your true essence gets put on the back burner because that's not what people may be hoping to you know and so you see it artistically that's why art is separated you know in concept from entertainment and from athletics you know the the, the we're bad at defining what we're doing we just say it's salsa right we're real good at grouping things under a title, sticking things in a box and forcing those things to conform to that box. When you say salsa, back in the 70s, if you said salsa, it implied 20, 30 different rhythms with 20 or 30 different applicable dance forms that were connected to them. You know, the musicians, to learn to be a Latin musician, you have to learn how to deal with all that stuff. But once the record companies realized that the salsa format was the thing that was selling albums, the artists were forced to, you know, make the albums less diverse. The salsa, when you say salsa in the 80s, you're talking about this very specific thing and the whole album is that very specific thing. And now the umbrella term salsa, which encompassed all these things, no longer means what it used to mean. Then you factor in that we're, we're doing these international events where everybody gets to put their two cents into what salsa is supposed to be. 
and now you're putting all the different salsas, right? You're putting the artistic salsa together with the competitive salsa, together with the Cuban salsa, com together with the, right, with the LA salsa, with the New York, with the on to, with the we break on this and you break on that. And you're putting all of that under the same umbrella with the same standards, with the same kind of pop appeal being expected of you. And all of a sudden, you know, there's no distinction now. What do you do? You don't do what I do. Like, y you can't compare us and say I'm better than you or you're better than me because we don't do the same thing, you know? It's like a painter and an engineer. How, what are you comparing in Zachary? You know, like, well, what do you think? You're not doing what I'm doing, right? I'm doing something completely different. And I see that all across the board, right? The Cubans' idea of what salsa is is completely different, you know? The, the, my, my concept, what I came up with, what was interesting to me is not what anybody's doing right now. You know, like the DJs aren't playing it. The kids aren't doing it. The stuff they're putting on stage, the stuff they do on the dance floor, the things that are important to them, it's not the stuff that, that motivated me. And you know, it's funny as I get older, I'm 47 years old, right? I've been doing this like uh, professionally and in a, in a formal capacity since I was like 19 years old. I, I, I had done it my whole life, but you know, like family and like dancing freestyle parties, family parties and stuff. My father was a salsa collector, so I've always been around music. As I get older, you know, when you're young, you're, the, 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 the world is a certain way, right? Your brain is forming until you're 25 years old. The stuff that motivates you and gets you excited to do stuff, the stuff that's available for you to do as options, like stuff that you see in movies, like all of that stuff is very specific. Once you pursue those things and you start to get into decades of like actually becoming the thing that you always wanted to become because your brain, you know, your, your taste was developed and formed by your environment. All of a sudden the environment is different now. The world has changed. Everything has shifted. And you're left kind of like, either it kind of worked with what you decided or it didn't. And slowly but surely, all the things that once inspired you, they start to fall off the end of the earth and they don't exist anymore. And so I keep finding that as I get older, it's harder and harder to find stuff that I dig, that I'm into, that satisfies my taste it gets harder and harder and more obscure and more obscure. And I have to keep listening to oldies and because people aren't making new music that's worth a shit, right? And so I have to keep going back to the well, you know, to Motown, to the Salsa Fania 60s and 70s. Like, I feel displaced in time. I feel like freaking Encino Man, you know? It's like, I feel like I, there was a time warp and I don't fit in and nothing inspires me and nothing is like, it's just like, man, w you know, everybody's taste sucks. And I, I feel like one of these old men that's like, what are these kids listening to? Like, what is that junk, you know? And it's funny how it happened, you know, because it was like, that's not gonna happen to me. And like, all of a sudden I sound like my grandfather, you know? It's, uh, it's really interesting, you know, that the, like I said, the whole like, Mr. Miyagi, the whole, like, even martial arts movies, what they were, you know, like, I read, uh, I saw a YouTube video uh, from a guy who's a, who's a martial artist, he posts a lot of martial arts stuff, really brilliant guy. He studies karate, traditional Japanese karate. And he said, by far my favorite martial arts movie, and I'm going to explain to you why, and it's going to surprise you what it is, right? And so he kind of laid out the, the format for what a good martial arts movie is, right? And it was interesting the way he did it because it was kind of a trope in the, in the 80s, you know, and the 90s where like you have a young kid who's like gets into problems, has to go to the mentor to learn from the mentor to then uh, overcome or it sets him on a journey to like overcome what he has to overcome and so he says 
following this criteria, the best martial arts movie ever made was Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> it was like, and it was like, what? Because it's, it wasn't like, it wasn't Eastern martial arts. It was like, but it's martial art, right? It's, it was absolutely martial art. And there were, there were some like samurai depictions and some of Conan's like teachers and mentors were, you can tell that they were like Mongolian. Um, so, but it was really interesting and, and looking at the structure of that movie, absolutely right. The kid, families decimated by this tribe of, of crazy religious zealots. He is kidnapped and made to work for his life, uh, you know, as a slave. He gets to a certain age and is forced to fight as a gladiator in these arenas. They teach him. He studies, you know, they make him because he has talent. They make him the best gladiator he could possibly be. Like unwittingly creating their demise, right? And then he has this burning thing to avenge his family and to get, you know, and, and he becomes through that journey, he becomes this forged instrument, like, you know, really beautiful concepts, right? Not, not necessarily beautiful in that capacity because it's all super barbaric and violent, but you look at the, like the Star Wars, how Star Wars, the, uh, the Joseph Campbell, um, like the hero's journey, right? The, the, the template of a hero and that what, like, you know, all these stories, how it resonates with us, like from Greek mythology and, you know, hero's journey, hero meets mentor, has conflict, I'm not going to do it, rejects calling, finally accepts calling, become, you know, like the whole thing, right? And it, you, over and over and over again, uh, greatest nemesis is somebody who is actually very close to them and because it's really you against yourself, you know, it's like this whole thing. What I'm trying to get at is that that stuff, right? I grew up with that stuff, inspired me. I'm on that journey as a dancer, as a martial artist. I was on that journey as a man. I'm on, I'm on that journey. Like that stuff is inspiring to me. Like I am now occupying the space of the mentor in that story. But the all the students, all the disciples are distracted with other things, you know, with, with other stuff, with video games, metaphorically speaking, you know? And so they want to be video game versions of dancers because the investment is un, un sexy to them. And the investment was so, so sexy to me growing up, you know, it was like the fact that I was bleeding and sweating for something was so attractive to me, you know? Whereas it is, they have such an aversion to, and most people do, you know, most, even in my, in my time, most people wouldn't put themselves through what it took, you know, it, it, it's almost, you know, I used to say I could never make a living teaching martial arts because you're basically asking people to pay you to abuse them, you know, unless they understand why you're putting them what you're through, what you're putting them through. But uh, at the same time, it's like you just, it, it's, it's more and more rare to find individuals that still have that mentality of like, I'll go to the mountain, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll even kill Bill, you know, like you live with the teacher, right? He brings her to Pai Mei, you know, and even that now is we're, we're 20 years removed, right? Like almost 20 years removed from kill Bill. I feel like it just happened the other day, you know? Um, and it, you know, Quentin Tarantino is old school Kung Fu movie influenced, you know, like all those things he sticks into his movies. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's a different generation with different influences and social media as much as like when I was young, we used to watch the Jetsons, right? And you, the, the idea of the future, like the idea of like, um, what's the word in, in design, they call it, um, they call it, um, shit, there's a word for it. It basically implies, um, damn it. Hey, I remember the term. So like the aesthetic of the Jetsons? Yeah, it's something modern. It's yeah. Like, um, 
it's like f the 50s idea of what oh, the, the future right yeah it looks completely different now right so when you design using that aesthetic you're using the ideas that people in the 50s had about what modern things in the future might be right um and so yeah it's like the you come up with those ideas in the 80s we had those ideas that the, the 70s and 80s the jetsons you know was like we're gonna be flying around and cars are gonna be flying and homes are gonna we're gonna build up instead of out and you know we're gonna use real estate in the sky to be you know zipping around and we haven't done any of that stuff yet and 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 we have a bunch of other stuff that isn't really helping us you know it's it's distracting us from making our lives easier we're making things easier that we don't need to be doing yeah it's stuff. just convenience almost i feel like for the sake of convenience it's like, it's like convenience and stuff that like in yeah like yeah addiction is easier to participate in right you have all these things that you're disposable right you have right. more with an iPhone. right so and like of all the things like what happened to cancer like what happened to AIDS? Like, what happened to us fixing those problems? Like, instead, we have AI may end up doing it, right? Like, AI may end up fixing some of those things. But, like, you know, we're, we're doing all this gibberish. And, t you know, our, our idea of being more advanced is in such a strange direction. And it's, it's caused a very, you know... Uh, surreal psychology in the people that are engaged in it on a regular basis and the people that are developing through it you know like their brains are developing with this access you know when i was born my grandmother had to damn you know zit -zit 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 right right, you know, right. Like, i miss that sound you know like there's a nostalgia in you know my phone was stuck on the wall with buttons and i had a little cord that i used to get wrapped up in talking to girlfriends in high school like for three hours on the phone we used to watch music videos on this thing called the box and it was like you you watch this scrolling menu of songs and it would have a little three digit code and you would call a number when you when you wanted to like see a video and you would stick in your three digit code and wait for your video to pop up you know and it was like it was called the box it was like you know, M MTV was one thing, but then you had this like, you know, menu pay to order. It cost like three ninety nine to like order a music video. Everything was music videos. I rejected a cell phone for the longest time. I was twenty five years old when I finally like acquiesced and got a cell phone because I hated that people could find me wherever I went. I enjoyed the fact that sorry I wasn't home. Like, did you leave a message? You know what I mean? It's like this whole idea of, oh my God, I, anywhere I go, like people can find me. I didn't, you know, was, that was weird to me. So yeah, like uh, I, my experience is broad. You know, my mother's even worse. Like, you know, she's, you know, came from even earlier than that. And so it's really kind of like super surreal. Yeah, sure. And the thing is that in order to really develop in something, you have to invest decades to do it, right? And and I, I would, like I said in, in my workshop, what is it gonna be in 20 years? Like you don't practice for now, you practice for 20 years from now. What happens in 20 years when you develop? I developed it and you look around and the world is gone. Like nobody cares that you developed it. It's of no use to anyone because nobody gives a shit, you know? It's, it's deep, you know, it's deep. It, it's the way of things, things change, you expect that. But what does it say about committing to something, about really deeply studying something in order to, to develop as an individual, not just to acquire gain, you know, to fall in love with the process of moving somewhere, not with, you know, letting go of being addicted to what it might bring you know, that's why we, we, I don't call it class at home. We call it practice. You know, I'm not teaching you how to dance. I'm teaching you how to practice. If you learn how to practice, you're set, you know, because it doesn't matter what you understand right now. The point is that you keep 
moving, right? That you manifest going, that you don't think that there's anywhere to get to. There's no get to. There's right. Only going. So it's pretty much like getting lost in the process, yeah. not so much like the destination. That idea, those yeah. Jack of all trades, master of none. What happened to that saying? How come nobody says that anymore, right? How come that's not a good thing to, to, to understand anymore? Jack of all trades is all anybody does now, right? Their master of, mastery of is like frowned upon, you know? It's like, oh, so you only dance salsa? And I'm like, I only dance salsa. The depth and the, the breadth of what salsa implies doesn't afford me any time to deal with the stuff you're interested in. I'm busy, right? Bachata has nothing to do with what I do, you know? I'm busy with 20, I'm busy with Mozambique, I'm busy with boleros, I'm busy with bomba and plena and rumba and son and bachanda and boogaloo. I don't have time to mess around with the stuff you want me to mess around with, you know? Because in your brain, I'm doing this singular thing, right? And that it's wrong for me to do. You know, there in Japanese swordsmanship, there's there is uh, something called the one cut school, right? And all they do, right, is a single cut. They do it for years and years and years. The, the art of drawing, Iaido is the art of drawing the sword. All they do is like draw and cut in one shot, put the sword back, draw and, and that's all they do. These people are practicing meditation, physical meditation, in order to achieve enlightenment through the, the vehicle of the sword, right? The Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi is about that, a person who was a prodigious swordsman to the degree that he won over a hundred duels and at the end of his life he was beating people with, uh, uh, with sticks, like broken off oars and stuff like that. Like He was, wasn't even using a sword anymore. He was that far ahead of everybody else because he wasn't worried about swordsmanship. He was using the swordsmanship to finally lighten, right? And so he practiced like a demon. You know, he had an affinity for it. He was a genius at it. But that genius allowed him the sight to see the matrix, pardon me, <coughs> to see what his gift could afford him if he used it a certain way, you know? And so he writes this instructions to his student, and that's what the Book of Five Rings is. It's like he's, try he's in a cave, like trying to leave a path for his student to follow, right? And that becomes this famous book that businessmen, Japanese businessmen, they go nuts reading this stuff, right? But that was the thing, right? You're, you're not doing the thing. You, you think that the problem is, I always tell people, the, the thing that brings people to dance isn't what keeps them there, right? You, you, the reasons that you go to find dance aren't really the same reasons that keep you dancing, right? And then once you have been dancing for a long time and you're there where you're kind of like either performing or doing it as a central, like your life has now become dance in the middle and other stuff at the periphery right once that happens the reasons are even different still right so what happens is that just like uh having a vantage point if you're climbing mount everest you can't predict what's gonna, where, what you're gonna see, right? You can make, like you can create hypotheses about how, what's gonna be up there. And in your mind, that's what you think you're working towards. The problem is that you don't really understand that until you start working. And then as you start working, your vision gets better, your vantage point changes, and you start to realize, oh, this is really what I'm doing, right? This is really what I'm aiming for. And then as you start to kind of solidify that, your vantage point changes and you start to get sight, right? That's, Bruce Lee used to say, you, you, a teacher gives, all a teacher can do for you is give you sight, right? And so 
Starting out, you have all these assertions about what you think you're trying to do with dance and what, where you think you're going to end up. And you try to find that in models around you. That's what I'm going to end up. That's what I want to end up like. That's what's waiting for me, right? And a good teacher would keep you like in check about that, about how much that influences how you continue on your journey because you're, that's going to change, right? The things that you're impressed with when you first start are not the same. They don't have the same impact on you once you become proficient. You look back on that and go, why did I ever think that that was cool, right? It's like somebody you dated in high school. You yeah. Look back and go, what the hell was I thinking? You know? it's like, yeah, but for whatever reason, like, I'll just add, like, like you said, how most reasons why people join dance might not be the reason that keeps them there but for whatever reason it serves its purpose I, yes. I, I, and i'd that's say the thing. yeah and understanding that is important yeah. right as a teacher that that you can't just punch people in the face the second they show up with all this depth because you're always dealing with an individual at a certain level of understanding and you have to recognize that you have to get good at reading that and understand what they need at the moment in order to understand what they need to understand so that their sight will change and they will naturally and organically start to ask different questions. And then when you, you can tell and discern from the questions you're getting where they are and what they're starting to want from dance and you know you can start to push them more and you can start to back them off of the opiate phase, right? Because we all go through that opiate phase. It's a drug at first, right? And you're trying to get a fix. And because the dopamine hit and all the stuff that it does to you and the escapism, like the idea of like dance helps me forget about my problems and, you know, all that stuff that drug addicts say, right? And people with uh, chemical dependency say, alcohol or, or the like, they say the same thing, right? You're, you're avoiding reality for a moment and it starts the pain the seeking solace from the pain, you know, starts to become the reason you, you can't let this thing go, right? And so that idea of avoiding life by dancing is just as dangerous if the thing is healthy to do as something that may be unhealthy for you because it's emotionally unhealthy, right? You, you if it's going to be, if it's going to be, you know, dance is life, then it has to be dance's life. I need to see the mambo of my parents just died. I need to see the mambo of I lost my job. Like that mambo is just as valid as the, you know, the people faking smiles constantly and thinking that dance is supposed to be happy and you're supposed to be having fun all the time, right? That's not life, you know, like that. It, if, if we want to get into it and we really want dance to be life, then it should be reflective. And it's so much more cathartic to have a place to go to work that stuff out. Like it, it's a perfect opportunity for you to express yourself. Like if you were a painter, you, you know, and you're angry and you, you start smacking the canvas, right? And so where is that in this? Like, what's going on with everybody you know it's like i just can't i can't wrap my head around the way people think about what they're doing like you know it's like they, they, is is there no art anymore like does is art not desirable to anybody anymore like it's 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 um you know of course it is or of course the answer is yes it is the problem is we're in this bubble this commercial bubble and here I am, this person who is coming out from outside the bubble to visit the bubble constantly. And every once in a while, you find people that don't belong in the bubble that are like, oh my God, well, you're an alien. Like, that, you're what I need. Why is this like this? And it's not the world, it's this bubble you're in. You know, and again, there is more, pop culture is a heavy thing, right? It's always been a heavy thing but it is heavier today because of the access people have on social media. And so it has farther reaching influence because you don't have to watch TV at a certain time on a certain day in order to get the message that pop culture is trying to give you. It's constantly 
bombarding you on a regular basis. And you think I'm the, the weird one because your brain developed with that. And so, I, you know, there's a saying, you were born on third base, but you think you hit a triple, right? You, you go through life as though you hit a triple, but you were born on third base, right? You, you, you don't realize that all this stuff had to happen for you to have the luxuries you have now that you think you earn. You didn't. You, you, you were born into this world all of a sudden. And how dare you try to dictate to me how I'm supposed to fit into the world that you've learned to, uh, when I've been here all this time, you know, before you were in diapers, I was doing this. Who, 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 who are you talking to? To, to play devil's advocate, I, I think that in a sense, like what you explained, just to give context to like Absolutely. our page and what we're trying to do, I spoke to Jose where, I, funny enough, I want at least Latin dance be super commercial, just in, just in the sense of growth, you know, like constant growth. And I, I can see how organizations or mega corporations, they, they kind of like all, even if they're different factions like Apple or Samsung, whatever, they kind of converge to like almost like a singularity. Right. And although I understand the pitfalls of that, there is that sense of like, you want the, whatever the living organism, your, you know, your world, your dance community to thrive and survive after. Right. And you want to plant seeds now. Yes. So future generations can thrive and experience something better. Absolutely. And I, I understand where you're coming from where, because you, you've been so focused on your discipline or your craft mm -hmm. that you've, I, I definitely admire that. And I know Japanese culture, they very emphasize yeah. like just, if you like as a sushi chef, you're just right. gonna cut sushi <laughs> like forever. Right. Like you're doing the most basic stuff, like just sharpening your knives. Like it, it becomes like, I don't wanna, probably not the most uh, politically correct term, but like you're almost like damn near art autistic about it. Like, yes. okay, it's I'm just before, right. yeah, it's in a, yeah. a, you start obsessing and you narrow down so much that even preparation right. to make the sushi right. becomes like a whole yeah. thing of its own, right? And I think, I think the way technology and people work, I think because humans create technology that it's bound to happen or like the process or the trajectory of, you know, how we think and feel and shape the world. It's, in my eyes, it's inevitable. Of and, course. Yeah. yeah it's, just, it's, it's not inevitable because it's, it's inevitable because of our hubris. Right? Yes. It's inevitable because we, it's very difficult for us to perceive of things outside of the realm of our observation, right? You know, I, I, I'm always thinking about the health of the thing, right? And so popularization concerns me because in, in what state will the thing be in, in that, in that environment, right? And so my, my focus is in, I, I feel like a doctor, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to go in and provide antibiotics where I can because I feel a tremendous responsibility as a custodian of the thing, of the art form, and that the art form was in my hands, in my generation's hands, and we screwed it up, right? And we, we left it off to the next generation worse than we got it, right? And so that's an important thing, right? There, there's a book called The Paleo Manifesto, and it's really about you know, eating paleo and what that means, right? But the first chapter of the book, he's talking about gorillas and captivity. And he starts to draw a parallel to how, you know, gorillas in captivity are unhealthy, right? They have higher uh, uh, incidence of, of heart disease, right? What happens is that they, they're giving them nutrients directly. The, the way we conceive of things being nutritious for us. Problem is that gorillas are not humans, right? Gorillas are eating all day long, right? They're grabbing and foraging all day long. They're chewing, they're chewing, their digestive systems are different. So immediately they get with stuff that we think is healthy, their cholesterol, their arteries, they turn into a mess, right? The other thing is that 
concrete and sunlight and environment and what that does to the psyche starts to mess with them psychologically. So what happens to us? We are basically animals living in captivity, right? We are not doing anything the way that we were designed to do it as an organism. And so what happens is our intelligence gives us the capacity to further that gap, right? And so everything that we confront, if you look at it, you can almost without exception bring it back to the juxtaposition between what we're designed and wired to do and how we're forced to live because of society and economics and technology, right? And how it differs, right? And the more we come up with stuff, the, the further the gap between the animal and the, 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 the way the animal has to function. And so, again, it's the, it's the old adage of, the, of the, our intelligence is our biggest, our biggest asset, simultaneously our, our biggest weakness, right? Because we're still, we don't, we're too smart for where we are evolution wise, right? We're, we're, we're too smart. We've developed too much too fast and we ha our bodies haven't had a chance to catch up to that, right? So yeah, like people live their lives thinking technology is life and that the movement of technology is inevitable in its life. But the, I think the reason we dance is because of the reminder to your lizard brain of what you really are, you know, like folkloric dance, ethnic dance is, is comprised of movements of all the reasons why human beings move, right? We, we, there's five, four or five reasons why we have movement, right? To gather food, to hunt, right? To migrate, to travel, to fight, and to procreate, right? To have sex, to reproduce, right? All those things, you see it. You see it in the dance, right? It, they show up in the dance. You see it in folklore. You see the hatchet being wielded. You see the migration happening. You know, every basic step is a form of migra is a form of locomotion, right? It's, you're just learning how to walk the way that this dance wants you to consider walking, right? It's all there, right? It's all there. And so what happens is not only physically are you becoming more in touch with your primitive, the primitive part of your brain, you're getting closer to the way you were put together to function, but rhythmically, right? You're becoming in tune with how to coordinate yourself with flow, right? And so... It's, it becomes meditation, right? It becomes, and, and the, the, every time I say it becomes meditation, like your, your analogy about the sushi, again, it's, it's not rigid for the sake of obsessive compulsiveness. It's, it's the Japanese tea ceremony, right? It's meditation in movement, right? The Japanese tea ceremony was developed by a monk who worked in the kitchen of his temple. And what they do in the temples is they formalize the way you do everything so that you can't do anything mindlessly. You have to do everything mindfully. You have to fold your towel in a very specific order. You have to fold your robe in a specific way. You have to wash your face in a certain order. Everything is ritualized. And what that does is it allows you to maintain your practice throughout every facet of your life, you maintain your mindfulness, you experience viscerally everything you interact with, as opposed to being casual and mindless and distracted and not engaged, right? So meditation has to do with you being able to function from your subconscious, right? Because your, your frontal lobe is translating the world to you, right? And so every time you do something cognitively, you're getting a, a level of separation from reality, right? Your subconscious is tapped into reality, right? And it will function the way it needs to function if you just let it do its thing, right? And so meditation allows you to 
right? The reason why you have a mantra or you have a koan is, and why there's so much that's nonsensical, right? That doesn't seem to make logical sense. What's the, what's the, the, the sound of one hand clapping? That's your, that's what you're supposed to meditate on, right? The point is not to answer the question. The point is to put a, a stint into the flow of your inner voice, your inner dialogue running amok, translating the world to you. If you can stop that damn voice in your head and just feel something and just observe something for the obs to like to be completely engaged in it. And along the way you develop your concentration because that's going to be necessary. And along the way you learn to relax and to be content and to be receptive, right? To be sensitive to information that's coming into you. I tell people to listen to music with their skin, right? You have to learn to listen to music with your skin. You have to be that sensitive because then when, when the music pushes you pull, you know, it's Aikido, it's Tai Chi, right? But you're learning to do that because you're learning to coordinate your body with music. You're also learning to manipulate and engage in flow with another individual, which is super satisfying. I, I, in martial arts or otherwise, I used to experience this super satisfaction of like being coordinated with another body, even if it was to like hurt them. There's this dance that happens, right? And immediately I felt it. I, when, in my early days, I would be doing these turn patterns and I would have this overwhelming like urge to like take my partner down and stomp on their throat, you know, because it's like the same thing starts to happen to you. You get into a flow of a technique and it does the same thing to you. It's like this, this like connected, you know, it is reminding us that maybe we're not as separate as we think we are, you know, that, that we're connected to all things and that our, our macro experience shows us waves and we think those waves are separate. And we don't realize that as, as, as individual as every wave is, it's still part of the ocean. It's still the ocean, right? And so we get, we get glimpses of it. And that we get intoxicated by these glimpses because your brain's telling you, yes, like this is it. This is what, how you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be turned on by deep rhythm because deep rhythm is it is primal it's primitive right it's 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 the way you breathe it's your heartbeat it's like it's the way you walk you nobody lacks rhythm right it it is it is absolute lunacy to think that somebody cannot relate to rhythm because there's very little that you do in your life that doesn't require you to have rhythm what we do is we expand and make connections about how rhythm functions and how we can be more connected and how that connection can facilitate subconscious interaction, which is more visceral interaction so that you can create in the moment because whatever you think you're trying to express, that's your interpretation of what you, it's your self-assessment of who you think you are and what you think you want to say. And usually it's basically, you're just a whiny kid that you feel something and you want to cry and scream, right? The process of discovering what actually needs to be said, who actually are you? What actually are you? That's the process of practice. Like that's why you go through the thing because it teaches you about what really is you and what is your self projection and how you are, you know, creating a value for yourself by the feedback you're getting from outside. Right. And so the value of the process is in that the self-discovery or the not what I'd like to call the non-self-discovery because ultimately what you come to realize is that there's nothing that you can put your finger on that is self, that's static, that needs to say anything, you know? It's just the flow is either operating through you, you're able to manifest flow and be part of it, or you are blocking it and in opposition to it and having a miserable life, thinking that there's something wrong with you, right? And so those are the important things. The sushi chef is, uh, is, a, is a Zen master. Like they, they're, they, all these Zen anecdotes, there's a, there's a book called 101 Zen Stories. It's a 
blast to read. They're funny, they're sad, they're, but they're so insightful about like how Zen, how, what Zen really is as opposed to being relaxation. We just use it to be like, we're gonna make your bathroom, you know, Zen, uh, really Zen, you know, it just means that you're gonna be able to relax. But Zen is so profound. It, it's so universal. It's like the, 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 it's like the universe and how it works. It's like quantum physics for your, for your soul, right? For, for your being, right? And quantum physics jives perfectly with Zen. At the atomic level, there is no distinction between, you know, at the quantum level, there's no distinction between you and the sofa and the water you're drinking and the water particles. And there's, you can't tell the difference between any of that stuff. Here at this level, yes, we see all this stuff, but like, you know, the, the, the sound waves and the light waves, there is no color, right? It's only wavelengths of heat, uh, wavelengths of light. Your brain and your eye are interpret, interpreting those things. There's no pain. That's your brain's interpretation of signals that are coming, right? It's like all these things you think exist. We don't see infrared. We don't see ultraviolet. We don't hear certain tones. The, the universe is not, is outside of our ability to observe it with the tools of observation that we right we're limited by like you know our, our tools are our body and our mind and um just to add to that i'd say that just going back to like you know earning pretty much struggling to and like for whatever endeavor whether it's dance or martial arts or business or whatever i i find myself firstly when i suffer and i almost like do things inefficiently where I fuck up myself or like learn the hard and long way. When I get to the destination, it in a weird way, even though it's less efficient, I feel way more rewarded, especially when I'm on my own uh, struggle or my own path. And to that, I, I can see where you're coming from, where dance is becoming almost like efficient while losing its essence like everything's becoming more efficient life in general it is in every facet and i can see where just struggling to let's say meet an artist and you really want to train under them versus oh i'm just gonna look at a nisco reel and, oh that's a nice highlight i'm just gonna learn this turn pattern like all right then i'm pretty much them right like obviously if you talk to the artists get to know them like how we're interviewing you there's so much more depth and like context on how they got there and there are similar, very similar struggles that if you just connected, reached out to them, like you said, tying back to quantum physics or like, just like the observable world, when you break things down to like the core concepts, like everything's just made up of atoms and matter. And like that applies to everything in life, whether it's dance, music, everything. So if you want to make that connection that everything is connected, then in a way it becomes more simplified, the more the more you train or pursue something with effort, the more you learn more about yourself versus like, like you said, I like uh, the, the definition of where you said the, the, the mentor or the master is like just facilitating for you to be a student. And like that clicked with me, like probably 20 minutes back where you're, you're, we're all students of life at the end of the day. And we're forever students because we're, we're, we're limited by our hubris, our flaws, our egos. And in a way, it's also beautiful. And I think that's how I see it where there's always the risk of sausage is becoming some like a aberration. And it's perfect. And but it's but perfect. It, there's a beauty yeah, to that absolutely. because without that risk of it being bastardized or like commercialized, without that that fear or that lot like rational fear, I'd say. Yeah. I think in a sa in the same way you you should be aware um worried about what the future is going to be like at the same time i could you can make the argument that it just makes your own lived experience even more meaningful because because you see so much value in it that you'd appreciate more yourself yeah. so i think it, it goes both ways and i just wanted to another topic i wanted to respond on was um like the concept of like being in the bubble and like commercializing and popular popularism, I think that will forever be there because the masses will be the masses. That's literally the definition of the masses, right? And in a way, I get what you mean where, okay, like let's say we have these congresses and these events and like we have all these workshops and there's like a trend, there's like personalities and there's people who are just 
let's just say their 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 popularity is from like their looks or just how charismatic they are or how well they network right and that i think that's always going to be a reality i i I tend to separate like okay like the 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 more physical and i'd say like real world interactions between people will always be there and i kind of separate from myself versus if I wanted to go down the rabbit hole of dance and like really just pick the brains of people who've dedicated their lives, like their, their entire being to it. I think there will always be a hunger for that, for people who specialize, like other artists, like they might look to you and your up and coming artists will look to you and see that you've had, you've studied their craft so much to the point where like it consumes you, right? To some degree. And I think just having, seeing, like through their own self journey, the more they obsess and dig down to a discipline, I think naturally you'll find the people who want that. And no matter what, I think there will always be a minority, you know, versus someone who just wants to learn like, like the turn pattern and like, they don't care about like all this side talk, well, perceived side talk of like, okay, let me explain this concept 10 different ways. So obviously you want uh, different people interpret information differently, right? And as a teacher, you want to at least have the most reach you have within the parameters of, you know, the location and the time frame you have. Right. And I think that's, that's because it's so limited and so rare and so vital and so important to you. I think that a lot of the importance comes from that because I could easily say, what if the more nuanced and more, um, the deeper meanings to why we live the way we do or why we think the way we do, why we act the way we do. What if the perceived like common sense is like, you know, like your connection with the world and people around you matters the most. What if that became like, we flipped it where that became the masses. Like I'd argue that maybe that would become, yeah, it, 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 like it would lose the meaning. Right. The answer is, you know, what she was talking about, about perfection is, uh, you know, and about things being beautiful is absolutely right. And, 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 and again, you know, that's the flow. That's what's happening, right? It's like having a bad dance. Like the, 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 the point is not for the dance to be what you think it's supposed to be. The point is to become part of what it is, right? How do, how do, I, how do I adapt to this flow, this moment of chaos, right? And so that's the thing. And my, my adapting is to be here and to, you know, and, and again, the, the answer is not to stomp it out. The answer is, it, the, you know, the, the, the goal and the, and the desire is to establish the fact that there are alternatives, right? And that the fact that I get people tilting their heads like my dogs at me when I tell them that this is not all there is, is the problem, right? Is that I, you're forcing everyone to conform to the limited concept you have of the thing. And so I'm just trying to let you know, you don't have to do it. You don't, you don't have to follow me. I'm not telling you what you're doing is bad. I'm telling you that I'm not doing what you're doing. And it's also possible to do it this way. And that where is the world that exists, you know, whether it's minority or not, where is that world for me to exist, for you to come join me if you wanted to do that, right? And so, because the, the masses won't allow it now, right? It's, they, they, it's not that they, they just what what like it's you you you're speaking yeah, slavobic to them right so um but you know in zen they they say that you know our our idea of perfection is completely skewed right like we we see perfection as being like this idea of like pristine and good and without pain or without suffering or without negativity and that's not that has nothing to do with perfection right that has nothing to do with reality that's our fantasy, right? So in Zen, they talk about a broke, like the broken mirror being exactly what it's supposed to be. Like it is the perfect representation of a broken mirror, right? It is your need for the mirror to be something that it's not that causes you to say that there's something, there's a flaw with the mirror, there's something wrong with it, right? The flat tire is exactly the perfect representation of a flat tire, right? It's that we need it to be, you know, and so we're the ones suffering. The tire is exactly what it's supposed to be. And the thing is that that goes for pain. It goes for suffering. It goes for discomfort. You know, all those things 
are just as valuable as being comfortable and being inspired and being happy and like the, the, they they're as much a part of life you deal with them just as much and we spend so much time trying to avoid the inevitable pain and discomfort and if we would just get to a point that we don't have to like it but we're it, okay like yeah, i'm okay be aware and be accepting yeah, of it yeah I'm, I'm i feel bad it sucks i'm just crying out but i'm okay with it you know this is how i deal with it i cry. But it's okay. Everything in Zen, they say everything's okay, right? It's okay. It's okay. Why isn't it okay? Why isn't it okay that you were disrespected, you know? And it's like, well, because I feel a certain way, but, but you know, isn't it okay to feel that? Like, it's okay to feel that. Yes, right? it's, definitely. It's cool. You scream and you, and you feel better. It's just a reaction yeah. from an input. Right. Either negative or, yeah. Negative, like, you could argue. A negative thing could be bad or, or good or you a don't positive thing could be, yeah. I always say an emotion doesn't validate itself, right? Yeah. So you, so because you feel bad doesn't mean there's actually something to feel bad about. Right. You, you just feel bad, right? right. We, we tend to, because I feel bad, then it must be, right? And whoa, 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 wait a minute, right? So yeah, the, 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 that's why in meditation, they make you, they put you on the floor and they make you twist your legs into a pretzel and you have to stay there with no back support for 30 minutes and then you got to get up and more, your legs are falling asleep. Because the, that first lesson is like, stay still, shut up, and it's gonna hurt a little bit, right? And why isn't it okay that you just gotta get used to being okay with being uncomfortable, right? And then stuff doesn't bug you the same way. When, when you're okay with stuff, I always tell people freedom is not getting everything you want. Freedom is being okay if you don't get what you want. Then you're free. Then you're, then you're okay in all circumstances, yeah. right? But if you get what you want, there, you always are inviting that. that yeah. You could be a slave to getting your dreams too. That's why I'll have these mental thoughts. Where are your thoughts. desires coming from, yeah. right? Why do you exactly. think that this is going to make you happy? Do we question that at all? We just want what we want, right? Right. And it could be from, most of the time, I see my desires from lack of insecurity, whether it's my upbringing or and that my, you can say that about everybody yeah, about everybody yeah. right about everybody and like for me let's say before my dance area i pursued fitness very heavily but it's strictly all ego based like fear and ego based and even though physically health wise i got to a very good state all the reasons why i did it was completely wrong but on the outside if someone looked looking in especially when i first joined a dance company, I would get admired by my phys physique, right? But people didn't realize how messed up I was in the head. I say that about uh, like, the, like um, the, 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 the idol worship, like our, our culture of idol worship of like, Michael Jackson is like the biggest, you know, you know and, every, and you don't realize this, this person is a goddamn mess. All that talent, that perceived talent, that relative talent, because it's talent, it's just a snapshot. Yeah, it's like, like you don't know the person. Absolutely like you, not. And, and that's like the scary thing where when you do connect with someone or do conversation or dance, whatever, you can never truly understand someone a hundred percent. No, because maybe ninety nine themselves. It takes right. you a lifetime to figure yourself exactly. out how you can understand it's somebody. It's like not only like them conveying who they are or who they think they are, and then it's you have to think the way they do too. So the scary part for me is like when I perceive information or anything new i wonder if it's just me or other people think like me and that that that's like where like my, my actual rational fear comes from it's just like you always have that like as you seek knowledge and purpose like i think that'll always be a constant where the things you know now the experiences you have like are you truly perceiving it correctly or is everyone wrong and you're truly alone? And there is no definite answer to that. And there's always that uncertainty that it's almost like, I think everything becomes just like a guideline. The more you know, the more I feel like. You kind of don't. No, and that's, that's the point. The point is to realize how little you understand and that there is no understanding. It's, that's not the point, you know? Yeah. The point isn't to, 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 um, to absorb the world and to be become a deity right it's it's to realize how small you are and for that to liberate you right it's like the to know that our nearest star is like 70 light years away and there's 200 billion stars in this galaxy and there's 200 billion galaxies and then you can't even perceive that you're worried about 
right. your job or right. like you know if we like it like popped out of existence tomorrow the universe would be completely like we're, we're, we're right? smaller than atoms Absolutely. like it's just like our our day-to-day -day worries and just like the concept of worrying like what does that mean in the grand scheme of like the universe right so i for some people that's depressing and i it, and and it's it like it is like it's almost like a curse if you look at that yeah it, it is liberating at the it, it, it it just needs to be everything is perceptive like you you just need to realize that it's okay like it's all okay right if you're not here tomorrow life goes on the trees keep blooming things you know like decay is the way of things the universe is violent you know Th things explosions we're here because of explosions you know so you know it's like we we again we live in in this universe of our experience and you know because of society and because of technology life is about the way you have to live and not about the way things work necessarily you know and, and so yeah f you know finding happiness and contentment the idea you know the these guidelines were set thousands of years ago and we talk about them less and less and every generation seems to kind of make the same mistakes over and over again and we are using less and less the wisdom of old to learn lessons and to piggyback on those lessons learned and try to improve ourselves more efficiently in 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 deeper ways in ways that will affect more of us more universally you know like this this idea of of uh self-image and, uh, and of and of uh you know problems that kids are having now with self-image because of you know and, and but we have social media and thank goodness we can advertise and who cares you know it's, it's so sorry that these kids have to go through this you know it's like what do you what the hell like but th those things if we were still using the things that gandhi taught us and the things that you know the buddha taught, taught us and like all these lessons that have been in existence for thousands of years it's like in the 60s they were still echoing some of these things and it just like slowly all that stuff disappears and yeah, I mean the 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 suffering, the 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 uh, the break of the cycle of suffering is is to understand the middle way, right? Is to understand that you 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 are free of suffering, not because not because suffering means pain. It's because your attachments, your attachment to things, right? Your attachment to feeling good, your attachment your feeling of addiction, right? Even love itself, usually you're describing addiction, right? It's like real love, you probably would phrase as compassion, like supreme compassion, and you have to really love yourself to understand how to love at all. Because if you're addicted to someone and you put the the responsibility on them to fulfill you somehow and make you happy somehow you're projecting that responsibility in a direction that has no you know that did that's not their responsibility to do that for you you know and so but we do that with things in life too like we think this now this has to make me happy and why isn't this making me and so yeah the, i mean the the lessons have been learned they've been taught they've been followed and we just forget them and we start all over and we forget them and we start all over you know and and again the world is going to keep transforming and but those things are universal and they're eternal and they're we're always going to have to come back to them no matter what shape or form our environment takes even if we end up on mars because we fucked the planet up right it's like we're still going to have to deal with our psyche the way we're wired and trying to find contentment and and purpose in this life for this you know or, or life in general like what it all means you know? So yeah, I, I um, at the end of the day, we're all slaves to the fact that we're human. I, you know, I, I like to make fun of that. I like to say, you know, it's a very human thing for you to say. Is that's a very human observation, right? That's something a human would say, you know. In Zen, they say you stink of something, like you stink of a, being a priest or a religious person, or you stink of being a musician, or you, you stink of of of, of being a surfer, right? You, like I can I can smell it a mile away because you're you're kind of perpetrating this thing, right? It's all attached to it. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, they, they always use these harsh words yeah. to make you feel a little silly about the fact that, yeah, it is kind of silly that um, I, you know, 
and sometimes it's offensive and they, and they do it on purpose to kind of like shock you into like isn't this silly? Don't you th right. don't you realize how silly this is? That's what I said. All right, real quick, yeah. I have to leave. Yeah. Yes. Go back to Phoenix. absolute mud. No, uh, um, no please keep, keep this running as yeah. long as you want. I just wanted to give one um, uh, theory or mention one theory. Just like I don't know, like if you already know it, then cool. But if not, I just it's called the region beta paradox, where like kind of like what you said, we're we're smart enough to like use technology or use our intelligence to have technology and like make things efficient, but we're not smart enough to like see the forest, which is like the universe or whatever. And like, I think we're always doomed as humans and as dark as it sounds, and I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but I think AI is better off without us. And I know that sounds horrible, but uh, like, I know we're, we're limited, you know? And I think like we're doomed to that, but at the same time, and that's okay. uh, I like yeah that's okay like for me it's just like well like if I could live forever let's just see how this plays out because it the, the trajectory of like how we live and like experience life it's bound to happen regardless like I feel like the the we can't predict the future obviously but I feel like the trajectory the the destination from that trajectory will always be like the destination I feel like there's a predetermination in some sort. Yeah. Or, I, we don't even yeah. know if we're a disease. We could be a disease yeah. and we're trying to like, we, we gotta keep going and we gotta keep yeah. going and we gotta like, keep it. Well, we took over the earth. Like, yeah. were we, were animals, were the predators really the biggest problem or yeah. is it us? Right. And it's hard to say that because I am human right. and I'm part of the human race. So it's like, he would, you know, yeah. And think about my thing, which you can't. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where like, at what point do we just break down ego and like, concepts which we we only conceive because that's how we think or how we think information is supposed to be and then what is information right. you know you could you could like pretty much like drive yourself crazy just asking like digging down asking we'll all these know questions we don't know yeah. and we just we just can't see far enough you know yeah. all we can do is speculate and yeah and then no matter how educated or how wise you are i'm not saying like you shouldn't pursue that but it's like the more you know especially for me like the more I learned, I realized, damn, I don't know anything. And that's like, that's the the, Dun the Kruger Dunham yeah, right Dunham Kruger yeah. effect, or the, the more you you really understand about a subject, the smaller you feel, and the less right. confidence you have in it because you have the sight to know right. how far it extends, and the fact that you're not even scratching the surface. Whereas somebody who is just starting out in it, yeah. they're acquiring uh, you know new knowledge and new skills very quickly, and they have an overblown sense of confidence in what they understand because they are novices you know and it's like this weird paradox that that uh einstein actually proved you know physically and but yeah it's like it, it, understanding these things about ourselves like I, you if you know you are susceptible to these traps it makes things a little lighter and you're a little more cautious and you realize that i'm doing this because i know that i'm doing this because i have an issue and i need medication you know that so to speak metaphorically speaking um and you know you can navigate it a little bit better, but to deny it and to be completely ignorant of the fact that you don't get stuff, you know, and then then making important decisions without the acknowledgement and the understanding that you don't get it, that's where we run into trouble. Yeah, and I think to tie back to dance, I know we talked about a lot of like abstract <laughs> like theories and concepts, but it does tie back to the topic. Honestly, it ties back to anything you want it to. But like for me, it's just. The way I see, like you say, you know, whatever discipline you and like starting out, you want to pursue a discipline, whether it be is to be an artist one day or, or an instructor or a painter or an engineer, whatever it is. I think going back to if, if anyone takes anything away, like for me, what stuck out was like just falling in love with the process, because as flawed as we are, I feel like the accolades, the, the, the milestones we reach eventually, I think becomes meaningless because it, everything one everything is finite yeah. two you know who's gonna remember a thousand years from now like right. honestly and and that's not to like put a damper on whatever passion it's just you should fall in love with the process if you like hiking or if you want to hike to like lose weight or whatever and that's the reason why but you end up falling in love with hiking just just because of the pure act i think that's where that's just the most enlightened I think someone can get. Just falling in love with the the thing they want to do instead of I want to do I want to dance so I or 
take classes to dance to get better so I can be at this level. And then you get there and you realize, I'm still just as miserable as I was before. Like this, like, like if you really break it down status, perceived status, like it's a man-made concept and it doesn't, you can derive a feeling of accomplishment from it, but I, in terms of happiness, I think happiness just comes from literally the daily actions and then gratitude. That's, that's all you can do because we're all gonna disappear one day and everything we know and love is gonna be gone. Like the state of decay is the constant and it's dark to bring that up because who wants to think about like the destruction, and everything, right? But that is the truth. And there, there's, that's why for me personally, like I'm a chaotic person just because I think so deeply about these things where I've gotten to the point where like, it's, it's a sense of hopelessness, the hopelessness just to live. I'm grateful for everyone around me and my experiences, like the people around me, but just knowing, no, I felt like I, I feel like my pursuit of like self-discovery and improvement in any way, it's just led me to this deep chasm that I'm slowly getting out of. I felt like sometimes too much information at the wrong time is like the worst drug ever. Like if you're not ready to learn something and you get the concept it it could like screw you over. So. Um, I think just going through the process of life and doing the daily things that you enjoy, wherever it takes you, I think that's like the best antidote to human existence because yeah. don't worry about what it's bringing you. Yeah. Just, just do 100%. wherever your, your energy, your heart, your soul is pulling you towards, just do that. And like Eddard, we just interviewed him earlier about that. He mentioned that too. It's just like the, I feel like the most. The deepest, uh, most important questions that will be answered most likely will come from yourself. Yeah, yeah. and it, 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 they have to. If you truly ask a question and you're looking for information, the most important information pertaining to you probably is somewhere within yourself. And through struggling, it's like meditation in its own, like struggling. Like if you're exercising, you're struggling, you're, you're dancing, you're doing choreo, you're, you're really suffering. You know, the, you have all this pressure under you, but if you can like, in a toxic way, if you can manifest like that, that, that transmute that suffering or struggle and you do it long enough without going crazy, um, I think like you'll have like a eureka moment where you're like, oh, like life makes sense to me, but it's not something where you can just, you know, linear, linearly find like the biggest answer. You can't force it to happen and just whatever directions you go in life, if you just pursue it as stupid and as in like inefficient as it is, I feel like going your own path in life and feeling a little bit lost is okay. I think that you, you become much more in tune with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being, being lost is the, is the, again, I would say, I would say that it, it's silly for us to expect understanding when statistically not understanding is much more probable, right? And so this, the same thing with like, with being lost, you know, like the, ha having a way is statistically not the thing we should expect. You know, we should expect to get lost and to be lost and to feel unsettled and to, and, and again, we're all going through it. Nobody's going through it as an anomaly. You're not that special, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, yeah. You are not special enough to, uh, you know, to be separate from the rest of the human race yeah. by having unique problems. We, we're, we're, you know, we, 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 all the same things are affecting us. And again, the influences and the way, you know, developmentally, what we're dealing with in our environment sets and predisposes you to certain things. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the out, the therapy, the, the religion, the, the self-discovery, all of that stuff has to be done by all of us. Like it, it has to be, it has to be realized in one way or another by all of us in some capacity. And we're all, that journey is going to be what it is for us, you know? And, and that's the, the fun of it, you know, like that's the fun of it, you know, is that we're, we're all the same in how different we are. Right. And you know, the, 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 there's nothing you're supposed to be. Supposed to is our fantasy. You know? right. Yeah. And there's comfort in like, like you said, like you're not that special or no one's <laughs> special really. If you really want to like dig down, like we're all the same in one way or 
more at least more similar to each other than dissimilar you know like we're done different absolutely and, and like you know just like i know you made a lot of pop culture references to movies and everything and i remember i think it was troy was brad pitt where he he spoke to i think like a slave boy or whatever he was like you know like the gods envy us just because you know we're or life is finite and because of that there's beauty in it because you know every, everything we perceive we want like you know importance of like you know roots and culture and everything if there wasn't a threat of like that being destroyed would would we really care and cherish that it's the looming and, and it's, it's like right that concept is so ironic because yeah. it's like okay well i don't want this to like actually go away but at the same time if it if everyone realized how important it was would it be important right. and that's just like the paradox just keeps going back and forth you know and we we use that in uh in performance classes you know the 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 fact that there's that performance on the horizon intensifies the the process of getting ready for the performance. Whereas if there were no performance and we're just gonna learn this choreography and we may or we may not do it, it kind of like, it, it never really has that culmination where then at the end there's this sense of like, oh my God, that was amazing and life changing. And But it's like, you need to know that there's that thing on the horizon. You always need to set limitations yeah. and pressure on yourself. That's why I think Another thing people should take away is like, don't shy away from struggle or pressure because it, it's easy to be like, oh, like I've reached the status in life where, well, you should, you know, you want comfort, you want stability, but it's like, in a way, like you shouldn't even seek that. And like my biggest growth or moments in my life where I actually changed and grew were in the darkest moments of yeah. my life. It wasn't when, oh, like I healed and I'm a better person. Like, no, I had so much shit going before. Right that like broke me down completely. And I had to like figure out a way to piece myself together. Like I can't discredit, majority of it was suffering. Like I can't discredit the suffering, just be like, wow, like I reached this happy place. Like there has to be context. It's like, you, I, I, I never learned anything from a tournament that I won. You know, when I won grand champion, it's like, wow, and I'm celebrating. But when I would lose, it was like, what the hell happened? And what do I have to do? And I. And, you know, and like, thank goodness it happened to me, you know, and it's like, thank goodness it forced me to like, you know, because it, it again, it's like, be careful what you wish for. And yeah. we don't really know how things are functioning for us until we have the luxury of, of retrospect to say, man, if this didn't happen, then I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have met this person. I wouldn't have got married. Like, you know, it's like, you don't know. We don't have enough sight. We're not, we don't have a bird's eye view. So you do the best with what you got and try to enjoy everything along the way, savor it, even the bad stuff, yeah. savor it, taste it, make sure that you swish it around in your mouth a little bit and don't just yeah. swallow it right away. Yeah, definitely um, just take every moment as it is. Like you said, like achieving your dreams or goals could be like the worst thing that could happen to you. And it's a scary concept, it's very so far out there depending on where your journey's at that it's kind of hard to conceive, but it's almost like it, even if you know that you should still pursue that because that's what you want currently right so in a way it's like you kind of want to get the thing to know if you really want it or not and it feels like a waste of time if you find out you don't want it but but it's going to put you some it's going to put you somewhere you need to be you know and that's even though sometimes i feel lost a lot of times just knowing that okay i should be where i'm at right now i should be feeling where like depressed that Everything you've gone to has led to this moment right yeah. now. Right. Every single thing you've gone through. As insignificant or like unrelated Absolutely. as you might perceive it Every to be. Every little yes. wind is blowing at a certain speed yes. is why we are sitting, you know, it's like that you, you don't really understand it. Like I said, you and don't understand I don't think it. you're supposed to really. No. I think no, that's no. the beauty of life. Like Absolutely. the mystery that it will always be a mystery. Yeah. It's just like, why are we here? But well, we're here now and you just take it for what it is and i don't know but yeah i definitely gotta go now guys um definitely continue this pleasure man hearing all this is all these all these things like um the hero the hero's journey yeah joseph campbell uh zen like buddhism uh meditation all those things are things that i've studied yeah through just um through my like when i began college i was just struggling and Really, it wasn't until I started meditating when I started to see like, okay, this is the source, you know what I mean? There's the source that, and and I need to, if I, if I were to 
everything comes through here. You know what I mean? Everything comes through here. So so if I I'm going somewhere that I that I must come from here all the way through instead of just like here. You know what I mean? So I've been struggling, you know, I mentioned it to you yesterday, I was like, I've been struggling just being in, in, in the community, in the dance community, and being a dancer, because I came in with one thing, and then now, you know, priorities are shifting, values are changing, I'm growing, and I want something else, I want something bigger, because I, my energy, my investment is bigger, yeah. and, and then I see, I have a vision of how I want things to work out, and like what I want to create and like what I want to bring to people because at the end of the day, what we're doing here is we're sharing ourselves. We're, it's an exchange. What, what you did was really important for me. Just so, just that workshop, just sitting there, I was like, man, like I've been needing this, you know? I've been, yeah, it, it, it's different. And, and, and like, like what you're doing, like I see you kind of like, like you are a, I want I won't say like a writer but more like a thinker yeah like like a philosopher yeah and and you use the what I what I felt was you use the dance as a presentation of a concept exactly and and I think I think that's what I think if we can kind of use that perspective in a way where we see dance as just a presentation of ourselves right. which is a larger concept then we're in tune with something which can, which, in, which we're basically tuning into a catalyst. It's a catalyst, right. basically. And just like meditation is. Now, finding the meditation within dance, that's really what I'm like, when, li after listening to you, that's really what I think about. Like, yeah. how do I turn this dance into meditation? Because at, this, at the end of the day, meditation to me is like self discovery. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's it. And, and to tell you the truth, You've probably already experienced it. It's just a matter of, of refining the fact that that's what you're trying to achieve and then adjusting your methodology so that it brings you to that place, right? In other words, the, the way that you practice has to account for the fact that you want to engage in the activity through your subconscious, you know what I mean? So that you, so that the, the, the real you is allowed to speak, right? And the real you is connected to everything and it, and it recognizes things. You know, there's, there's a thing that I used to do, it's really deep and you, I mean, it's hard to, for anybody to try it, but because I live in New York City, I have a unique opportunity to like apply this concept. So that book that I mentioned uh the Gorin no show the the book of five rings by Miyamoto Musashi the swordsman he uh he mentions uh, a technique of um he, he's talking about the stance that you should adopt mm -hmm. and he says that you should unfocus your gaze right and which is counterintuitive because that in sports you're trying to like watch the ball watch the ball right mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with somebody swinging a sword at you, you can't be focused on anything. You have to be focused on, like you have to have supreme attention, not just with your eyes, but with your entire being, right? And so what happens is there's this, this thing called synesthesia, right? Which, which uh, is that your senses are connected neurologically, right? And they affect each other, right? And, and it, they, they don't just work independently. And as children, we have it much stronger and some people actually retain that into their older and they they're called synesthetes and they have issues where they you know if they hear a sound they get a taste in their mouth or they they see colors when they hear about math or whatever it's bugged out right but your brain is constantly playing tricks on you that way right so what happens is if you close your eyes your ears become more in tune right you notice that if you're focusing very hyper focused on your phone somebody could be asking you a question and you don't hear them at all you know so what happens is, that's what I meant when I said listening to music with your skin, right? That you, it, when you broaden your gaze, all of a sudden your skin gets more sensitive and you're more reactive, right? Because you're not relying on visual information only and you start to implore all these other tools that you have, right? They start to get heightened. So what happens is I would meditate on the subway while I was sitting there and then I would stop when I would get up to go to the studio because now I got to walk and people and not kill, not die, right? On my way to the studio, I'm walking through Penn Station in, in Manhattan, just like one of the busiest areas in the universe, right? 
So eventually I started thinking, wait a minute, like I should be able to like maintain my practice while I'm walking and I wonder what would happen, you know? And so I started doing it. Like I started to uh, not stop doing my practice and get up and get to the studio. And I would get there much more successfully and much more efficiently because I wouldn't focus my eyes and everybody that would come by, I'm intuitively dodging and dipping and moving and taking the right step at the right time to avoid whatever. I can see the traffic lines and how people are walking and I can anticipate and, but I'm just doing my practice. Like my brain, my subconscious was taking over to keep me okay, right? And it happens to you when you're, when you're fighting, when you're in boxing or when you're in martial arts, it's like you, somebody moves and you, your, your subconscious has to because you can't cognitively react that fast, right? Your brain's gotta make, start making some calculations about what might happen in the future and, and kind of get you to, to go there without you thinking too much. And so if you were to apply that simple thing, right, in a social dance or when you are practicing a pattern, unfocus your eyes, right? F listen to the music with your skin. Interact with your partner through sensory information, not through staring them dead in the eyes or trying to figure out where they're going and what they're doing visually, right? And now you're much more connected. You're much more in tune. It's not a cognitive exercise. It's a subconscious exercise. And you let what's going to happen happen. You see what your body and your brain will do automatically. And you will surprise yourself how much you do the right thing at the right time, you know? It's a beautiful thing like the, the, the follow in the lead and follow like conversation because first of all i, I we're we're all follows first right we all it's like we all start out as being female and then like a chromosome is i think removed or added and that, that's what either determines if we're male or not and so we're follows first we're, we we all have to learn how to be receptive and how to be connected and it, no matter what i have to figure out who i'm dancing with i have to figure out what song what this song is doing. I have to figure out what space I have. I'm, I'm receiving and, and, and uh, adapting to information that's coming in constantly. How do you think you're dictating anything when, you know, the first thing you have to do is listen and receive what the music is doing, what's the tempo, what's, where's the rhythm, how is this working, right? So we all start out as follows first. If, I'm, if I first engage with my partner to receive information instead of to blast broadcast constantly you have a very different engagement right and and in order to be sensitive enough to function that way you have to turn it off like you have to turn the 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 cognition part of it off and go on autopilot and you start to get good at getting into the trance that happens to us you know every once in a while by happenstance and we enjoy it so much but we have no idea how to access it on a more regular basis but that's the goal. The goal is to get to the trance, right? Because the trance is reality. The trance is your, you know, they, they've done studies on um, whether we have free will mm -hmm. or whether, you know, things are, are predisposed for us, right? And so there's that con conflict constantly of cause and effect and uh, free will, right? So they did test some people neurologically. They test uh, brainwave activity when people are making a choice. And they found that the brainwave activity started to change before the choice was made, right? Well before the choice was made. Not when the choice was made, like, and, and not even when they saw the question. There were, there was, there's other studies where people were uh, having emotional responses to emotionally charged pictures, and the, the, the change in their emotional response was happening before the picture was shown to them, right? It's deep, like this deep, bro. We, we don't really understand time. We really don't understand the brain, right? So, but, um, so what's happening is that you're being acted upon by something is, something is getting turned on that's helping you make the decision, right? 
and it's like your subconscious, your 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 trauma, your you know previous uh, experiences, like whatever is happening to you that kind of leads you to make a choice, starts to get turned on when you have options placed in front of you. And so they they talk about that's not really freedom. That's you kind of like you don't realize you're a puppet because you're being influenced by all this is like what he was talking about you know about like you know the the your environment causing you to have this perception of yourself and it's like you're you're being manipulated and you don't realize it right and you think it's free will but it's in disguise so where do we find freedom how do we find freedom you find freedom in the trance you find freedom if you can get to the source of the signal right if i can get to the place that's starting the brain activity then I can get to the to the to the real nitty gritty of where the actual freedom is. Where is it coming from? Right? What's acting upon me? I want to look behind the curtain. Right? So that's what happens in the in sushi. That's what happens in the tea ceremony. That's what happens when you sit. Right? You turn down. You turn off the cognitive part of your brain, and you get more in touch with the subconscious part of your brain. And in Zen, when they test you, they're testing how connected to your subconscious you are. Right? They ask you a question and you blurt out an answer, logical or illogical, you know, a smack in the face, a stomp of the foot, a, a, a silence, you turning around and leaving, you screaming. Those are all answers as long as they come from the right place and they're, they, come, they happen to you and not that you thought about it and tried to produce it, right? That's why I talk about in dance that you're trying to let the dance happen to you. Mm -hmm. That's the trance. That's the meditation. You're, you're, it's a subconscious endeavor because that's the music, right? Somebody once described uh, uh, like a Jimi Hendrix solo as an audible, you being privy to an audible stream of consciousness, right? Like he's making it, he's manifesting his brain activity for you to be able to observe it. Like, that's what's going on. And yeah. like right. And so that, because, you know, there's something called entrainment, right? Where if, if there's a frequency, a rhythm that's at a certain frequency, your brain will match the frequency and start to lock on to it. Right. And that's what makes you feel like you're in a trance. That's where house music and trance music and all that stuff, samba, right? All the stuff that we deal with, with these heavy rhythms that are you get entrained, right? And so your brain is now locked in. There's a reason why, why does that exist? You know, like that's deep, you know, that's, that's telling us something. Yeah. And so being entrained, you know, is being connected. You, you're like, your brain is like, we're, we're, we're getting, we're, we're jumping on this train and we're going to ride it. This is what we do, you know? And it's like, oh shit, like you're a passenger now. And again, that's where the real stuff starts to come through you. When you plan it, when you think about it, when you try to practice in a way that tries to ensure a specific outcome, you are messing with the flow, right? You're interrupting the flow. You're the, the I is in the way, the ego is in the way. You are messing, you're interrupting the process, right? And that's athletics, right? You, you athletics, you practice something the same way over and over again, so that it will it it will produce a reproducible res response, right? That you can do it over and over again exactly the same way because you need to get the same effect from it. That's athletics. That is not what we're doing. That's not what I'm doing, right? I don't want to get locked in. What I practice is being honest, and that being connected to what is going to come out when it comes out and not to deny it, not to try to shape the future because inevitably you're going to fail at doing that, right? Because life is going to do its thing, whether you like it or not, no matter what you think it's supposed to be, it's going to be what it is, right? Reality is going to be what it is. And that's what I mean about being okay with something is that you had a different plan, but the universe doesn't give a shit about your plans, right? Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes the plans spur us on to certain actions. And like he was saying, um, you know, the, the, the idea of why you get interested in something may be a bad 
reason, but it's absolutely valuable because it got you there, right? And sometimes that drive is what you need to get going, like get those rollerblades moving so that you can get on your journey, right? And so you needed to have that possibly unhealthy impetus to get you going, right? And hopefully you, you run into the right people along the way to kind of like give you the right uh, uh, redirection so that you like, oh, this is why I'm really doing it, you know? And then you, you're on your way. I, I, will, I wanted to add that um, what you said about, I think like the fact that you have to let it, like let it flow. It's only like you're letting go and 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 when you when you talk talk about dance, I also I could just replace that word dance, uh, or when I talk about life, I could replace that word with dance, exactly. right? And and like um, when you say life happens to you, dance happens to you, music happens to you, and and I think for me, some I, I listen to like various spiritual teachers, and I had this hint or like this uh, um, intuition that that our bodies already know what it wants to do. We just need to get out of the way. And training shows us how to get out of the way until it doesn't. That's a Zen yeah. concept, right? You already have everything you need. You're going through this whole process just to realize that you were you were the way you needed to be right from the jump, right? It, it, it's You already had all the... the that's why I, I said yesterday, stillness is the highest form of movement, right? Uh, yeah. So... But you have to go through all this movement to figure out how to be still, you know. Sure. And we could all we could have been still from the beginning. We didn't have to go through all that. It's just we, and but we, we, you know, we're kind of knuckleheads, and we need to go through that in order. But that's yin yang. That's like mm. the circle concept, right? That you, you know, in, in karate, you get a, a white belt to start. Then you eventually earn your way to a black belt, and then after a while, that black belt starts to fray and it starts to shred. It starts to get worn in and beat up and it starts to turn white again, right? And so the masters have these beat up, shredded, you know, just a little bit of black on it, but it's almost completely white and it's this beautiful representation of her, that's why I wear the white shoes, you know? It's like this, this representation of the beginner's mind of like the fact that you were already okay the way you were and you're just trying to get back there, right? We're trying to get back to the child's mind. They talk about the child's mind or the beginner's mind, the, you know, motion, no mind, you know, it's like the, those are big concepts in, in Eastern philosophy and, and they resonate and they're universally applicable. That's how you know your stuff is solid, right? That's how, that's how you know your, you have your shit together, right? In, in other words, that your concepts stand the test of being universally applicable, right? And so when I'm teaching a class and a teacher of children comes up to me and says, we, we do the same exact thing in, in childhood development. And somebody who's a quantum physicist says it's the exact same concept in such and such theory. And somebody else who's a musician comes up and says, and you see this resonance of application of the same concepts, these universal concepts, you start to realize I'm, maybe I'm on the right track here. You know, like I'm, I, I don't believe in, uh, you know, mistakes or something's wrong or something's right things either allow you for infinite progression or they are limited concepts that eventually you're going to run into a ceiling right and so what happens is if there is if that concept is limited then i something's wrong with it i have to readdress the concept and adjust it to open that ceiling to allow me to continue to move and so a lot of things are okay right now. Like, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how you hold your partner at the very beginning, but as you start to grow, you're going to have to come face to face with the fact that you are limited now because you chose to adopt a certain hold mm -hmm. and your teacher didn't understand enough to set you up early enough so that you didn't, now you don't have to undo all of this stuff in the way that you're interacting with your partner. And, and, that goes for how you use your feet, how you step, how you change weight, how you, how you work out for dance. If you decide to work out for dance, a lot of people work out and all it's doing is interfering with their ability to dance because they don't know how to work out for dance, right? For the dance they do the way you want to do it because it's hard to understand that until you understand the dance, right? So 
we do tons of stuff that is completely counterproductive to us developing and what we're trying to do but it's because we're flying blind most of the time that we don't have good teachers and the, again teachers that it doesn't have to be dance right it could be a really good music teacher and you'll go oh shit that's the same i could use that and dance exactly the same way I learned stuff from the Discovery Channel. I learned stuff from reading books about Zen. I learned apply stuff from freaking um, from karate, the, the way that we used to do things karate. It all works because it works, you know. And they, there's a, there's a, this concept that mastery is mastery at the end of the day, right? The methods are varied, but the mastery is universal. In other words, the way that you arrive at mastery. There's a lot of different roads you could take. I can choose the violin, I can choose making sushi, I can choose dance. But at the end of the day, what, what it means to master something, to become a master, really isn't a, a moment. It's a part of pr the process, but it's the same thing. We're all gonna realize the same thing if we are lucky enough to arrive at mastery, right? It's universal. It doesn't matter how we got there. The idea is, right, it's far beyond the technical methodologies that we came up with in that kind of spurred us on to this self-discovery, right? There's a, somebody said there's no study worth undertaking that isn't a study of the self, right? In other words, whatever you do, if it's not you working on you somehow if it's not you discovering you then it's not really worth studying right it's not worth the effort and all that really means is that everything is inherently has the potential to be right self-revealing right you just have to know how to participate in it with the right mindset so that it functions for you that way and and again the concepts you know, you put concepts together in terms of methodology, in terms of what, what are the goals. If our goals are different, then what are the methods that we're going to use to achieve those goals? Those things have to be in line with each other. I can't have conflicting philosophies in different parts of the dance. They should all line up. They should be the same in different places. We never push. We always pull. doesn't matter what we're doing. We never push. We never pull. We never use force. We operate from relaxation, not from tension. All of that is universal. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about, you know, in this area, you do it this way. And in this area, you do it this way. Right. And then you start finding out it also works for relationships and it also works for, you know, uh, job pursuits and, uh, uh, intellectual pursuits. And, you know, it's like all of a sudden you realize that it's universally applicable. And that's the, the, why Zen is so like interesting to me because you know, I, I, I studied with the karate master and I tried to find the Zen master. And the karate master was the master of karate. The dance master was the master of dance. And the Zen master is the master of everything, right? Of, of all the underlying stuff that everybody else is using. That's where Zen is going. People say, oh, I do yoga. And the, in Zen, they talk about constantly how there, there's no enlightenment to be found in India because they they stopped doing it right when they brought it to china they stopped doing the zen stuff of it mm -hmm. it immediately became a chinese art which immediately was refined by the japanese and the chan chinese chan uh which is the word for zen is very rare uh and even within buddhism there's like i don't know how many hundreds of types of buddhism but they're not all Zen focused. They don't all have that focus on enlightenment. And so they, some people, they meditate, but they're not using the, the, uh, the honed Japanese methods of achieving these like tried and true methods of getting people to have these realization experiences and to train them into the depth of that and to get them to be competent teachers of that. And, you know, they, they kind of refine the process. And so... When, when I, you know, you, you can always tell where somebody is in their understanding because my Zen understanding will always apply to, to the stuff that you're coming at me with, you know. And at the end of the day, Zen doesn't really agree with these other roundabout ideas. And they're, they're probably right. You're, you're, pro you're, you're probably not going to 
find enlightenment, so to speak, quotes, unquote, through a physical endeavor, you're going to have to get into the pure practice of ultimately being still and sitting and, and being directed by somebody who can show you how to sit that way. But, but they use in Zen training art to teach and deepen Zen understanding, photography, painting, calligraphy, right? And so absolutely it is there, it exists. If you do them in concert, you're just enhancing your, your work, your spiritual work with what you're doing with, with dance. And at the end of the day, like I said, you know, ultimately you hope that everybody realizes the potential of the dance in its purity, the cultural significance of it, the, the, the depth of possibility for it to affect you and to affect others, right? The fact that you work on yourself and you practice as hard as you can because you don't know how it's going to change the world, right? You don't know how it's going to affect other people. I would say your practice is not yours. It's for everybody. You don't practice for yourself. You practice for everyone, right? No, the people couldn't, uh, couldn't break the four minute mile. That was like an impossibility. Four minute miles impossible. And then once one person didn't did it, all of a sudden people started being able to do it left and right. Right. So like collective consciousness, like we're all connected. We move together, whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. And so you work on yourself because, and I work on myself and here we are talking about how it's affecting you, how it affects him, how it affects other people that are here, people that have never met me in Africa that tell me that they've been affected by things I've said or things that I've done on stage. You know, it's like, you, you don't know. It's a big responsibility to think about that. But at the same time, it makes you hunker down and like every time somebody gives me a compliment it makes me want to like i got to keep working man i got to keep moving i cannot slack because i feel like everybody's depending on me and it's like including me you know like including me my my the options for me will broaden if i can broaden my options and the options for everybody will broaden and so yeah it, it's uh it's a beautiful thing it doesn't have to be uh, what anybody else wants it to be. Um, there are many different ways to engage in dance, in this dance. We should respect all those ways and their importance. And while I'm doing that, I just want everyone possible to know the possibilities so that they can make choices. It's like you, you're going to paint your house. Let's show you all the color options. These are the colors we have. These are the colors you can do. These are the styles you can use. And so you can make a choice, you know, and let's help you understand some of the repercussions of some of these choices so that you can have informed decision making power and not just think that you have to be a Congress cabaret dancer in order to pursue this you know, to any depth so that there's possibility for those that may not feel like that's the thing that's attractive. Yeah. I know. Uh, well, we, we, we should, we're going to have to end soon. Yes. Um, very interesting. Yeah. All of this. I know like I could talk for yeah. a good amount of time. Where can people find you? Frankie Martinez dot org. Uh, Frankie dot Martinez on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place. Uh, AfroLatinFunk.dance. I have online classes there, and uh, you can see my schedule on my website as to where I may be traveling at any given time and and uh, where I can be booked. All of that information is on those sites. So yeah, I I hope uh, you know to have contributed something to the conversation and to continue doing so. And and I really appreciate you having me and 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 uh, hanging out and shooting the shit for for all this. No, oh, this was great. I love it. And I know people are going to love it too.